Please join me in the call to worship. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We believe we shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Let us worship God together. In the mercy of our Lord, let us confess our sin together. We know that our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O God. And yet we continue to seek security in so many other sources. We would rather rely on our own efforts, our own assumptions, and our own abilities than surrender to your grace trusting that you will provide for us. Yet you remain patient with us. You call us again into your presence. You ask us to trust deeply in your promises to us, made plain in Jesus Christ, promises to watch over us, to free us from sin, to bring us yet more fully alive, and to hold us in the palm of your hand. Forgive us, Lord, for forgetting these promises, and call us again to your side, through Christ our Lord.
The good news that we celebrate today is that Christ calls us to new life and by his grace enables us to begin again and again and again and again. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And friends in Christ, in response to this gift of God's grace, how then shall we live? With gratitude, following after the Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. This is the way of Jesus in whom we find life.
Surely we count the gift of beautiful music among our joys this morning. Also among our joys are that uh, Cordy and Christian Matthews, who are members of the Emmaus class, welcomed a daughter on August the 4th. Stuart Ruby Matthews is her name. And so we are celebrating with Cordy and Christian and Stuart as they begin their life together as a family of three. We are also rejoicing that Doug Kamen is home recuperating following a long hospital stay for pneumonia and some other health concerns. Uh, but we continue to pray for him for his ongoing recovery. Uh, and our prayers are also lifting up Lewin Kellum this morning as she and Brian and their families mourn the loss of her father, Bob Kellum, who died early yesterday. Mindful that there are other joys and concerns we want to bring to God's feet, let us take those to God now in a time of prayer. God of all creation, we bless your name and ask for your help in learning to trust our lives to you, to see the lesson and the beauty of the lilies, to serve as your faithful people gathered here today to pray and sing and celebrate your love. We come because you have called us to be your people. We come even though we cannot see where you are leading us. We come to rest for a moment and to rest our hope on you, O Holy One. We offer praise and thanks for this new life, shown forth in the beauty of nature around us, in fresh dreams for a peaceful future and the unformed shape of things to come. The hope of reconciliation and your call to the work that to give our lives away in love. God of love, we know that throughout history you have called your faithful people to be stewards of your mysteries to trust you always and pour out our hearts to you in prayer. So we bring to you the burdens of our lives, the pain and fear that burdens those we love, the pain and fear that burdens those we do not yet know well enough to love. And we bring the pain that we have caused and the pain that we have suffered and ask for your healing grace. And we pray that the gift of your healing may be poured out on all those places where people rise up against oppression, where threat and violence cause fears to rise and hearts to close against the needs of others. We pray for hope to see the mystery of your healing love poured out for the healing of war and violence, and for the faith to offer what we have to those in need, even if we think we don't have much to give. Hear now our prayers for those in need around the world that we offer in silence. Hear our prayers for those across this land. For those within this very room. And for those we carry deep within our hearts. We lift up these petitions to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. to invite all the children to come and join me down here for a moment, please. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing today? Good? Let me ask you a question. Do you ever worry about things? 
Jack M., do you ever worry about stuff? No? See, this is what's so beautiful about you guys, because you don't worry. Guess what grown-ups do all the time? Worry. We spend a lot of time worrying. I think some parents probably worry about you guys coming up here and grabbing the microphone and saying something really loud. That's what we worry about as grown-ups, right? But worry is something that we all do. It's a very real thing. But let me tell you something, friends. Our story today in the Bible is from the book of Luke. And you know what it says? It says, do not worry. That's really hard to do. That's really hard to do. Not worrying is something that us grown-ups have a hard time doing. And it's it's not as easy as just saying, do not worry. What I'm going to ask you to do is close your eyes for a second. Everybody close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. And think of the most comfortable, quiet place you can be. The place that you feel the safest and the warmest and the best. Close your eyes and think about it for a second. You got it? Because when we take a minute to find that place that we feel so safe and so loved and so comfortable, that's when we stop worrying, isn't it? And you know what I'm going to tell you about that place? That place is where God is. It may be a real physical place that you put in your brain, but in our hearts, the way we stop worrying is we let God in there. We let God inside of us, and we let God make us feel safe, and we let God make us feel comfortable, and we let God make us feel loved. And when we do that part, we truly can do what Jesus said, which was, do not worry. And what I want to show you is, we have this basket at the back of the sanctuary now. And every week when you come in, it says children's art as offering. There are going to be different choices of sheets. And one of the ways you can stop yourself from worrying is to be doing something like coloring. So maybe you're having a rough morning. Maybe you've been bothered by something this morning or at school last week or just having a, a, a moment where you need to let go. One of the ways I want you to be able to do that is to make something beautiful to share with the rest of this church. So you're going to pick a sheet each week, you're going to color it during our opening time or our sermon time, and you are going to put it in the offering plate, and you're going to offer it to the rest of us to see what beautiful things you can create together, or on your own, and we can share together. Does that make sense? So remember, find that safe place inside, if you're worried, where you can let God be and where you can let God sit. And that'll help with that worry. And then use your moments to create something for somebody else. Because guess what? These are going to go out in cards to other people who are worried or who are maybe sick. And you're going to help eliminate some of their worry with the beautiful thing that you've created. Sound good? If we just give God a chance, I think God will help us a whole lot in stopping our worry. But we got to give God a chance to do that. So everybody grab a sheet and then pray with me. You ready? One sheet and then we'll pray. Here we go. All right, I pray, then you pray. Ready? Dear God, thank you for giving us hearts where we can feel you. Stop our worries so we can love each other well. Amen. Head back to your seats. Thank you, friends.
Our first lesson is from Psalm 4. If you look in the Pew Bible, it's on page 480, and you'll notice that at the end of the second verse and at the end of the fourth verse, there's this word Selah, or Selah. Uh, When I read that word, I'll stop for a moment because that sort of breaks up the thoughts, and it will give you an opportunity to Think about the two verses that precede it because the thoughts are a little different. So let us pray. Oh God, send your Holy Spirit and quicken us in heart and mind so that as the word is read and proclaimed, it may become real and alive to us. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Selah. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. This is the word of the Lord. If you hear last week, then you know that Ed preached on the beginning of Luke chapter 12, which recounts the story of the rich fool whose life's work is to build bigger barns for himself. And in his sermon, Ed helpfully pointed out that the man's problem was that he consulted only himself about what to do with his wealth and his possessions. And then he encouraged us to remember when we are faced with the same questions to consult God that God might direct our generosity. Today we hear the passage that directly follows that story and in many ways is a commentary on it. So listen with me now for God's word as it comes to us from Luke chapter 12, verses 22 through 34. Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? If then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that strive after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here ends our reading. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. We have carved out this sacred space in our morning, O God, that we might hear a word from you that we might be stirred afresh to follow you with all trust and all expectation. So be at work in us now by the power of your Holy Spirit, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In a now famous TED Talk from 2014, writer David Brooks talks about the difference between what he calls resume virtues and eulogy virtues. 
Resume virtues, he explains, are the things about you that you would list on a resume. The skills you bring to the marketplace, the outward accomplishments that distinguish you. Eulogy virtues are things that will be said about you at your funeral, what, which cut a bit deeper who you are in the depth of your being, what is the nature of your relationships, are you bold, loving, faithful, forgiving, dependable. And Brooks asserts that while most of us, including him, would say that the eulogy virtues are the more important set, they are not the ones we spend the lion's share of our time thinking about. Drawing on the work of Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, Brooks goes on to say that we have in each of us two natures, which he calls Adam 1 and Adam 2. Hang with me. Adam 1 is the worldly, ambitious, external side of our nature. He wants to build, create, innovate. Adam 2 is the humble side of our nature. Adam 2, he says, not only wants to do good, he wants to be good. To live in a way internally that honors God, creation, and our possibilities. Adam 1 wants to conquer the world. Adam, too, wants to hear a calling and obey it in the world. Adam, one, savors accomplishment. Adam, two, savors inner consistency and strength. Adam, one, asks how things work. Adam, two, asks why we are here. Adam, one's motto is success. Adam, two's, Brooks says, is love, redemption, and return. Perhaps I am not the only one who recognizes my own experience in this explanation of the complexity of human nature and the inherent tension it describes. How it is possible both to want to build up our resumes even as we want to cultivate those things in us that make for deeper living. How it is possible both to want to use our gifts to their fullest capacity to establish our lives and at the very same time, we long to heed Christ's call to lose our lives, that we might finally gain them. To forget ourselves on purpose so that we might discover who God made us truly to be. So that in turn, we might live in the freedom of that identity. The truth is, Adam 1 and Adam 2 both have a role in our lives. We need both the impulse to create and achieve and the desire to understand and to serve. But Brooks thinks that along the way, these two impulses in us have become out of whack. And that is largely because of where we have chosen to give our attention. And the problem, he says, is not so much that these two natures stand in tension within us. It is that we live in a culture that prizes Adam 1 and his resume virtues, often at the expense of any cultivation of Adam 2 and his eulogy virtues. So while we might say that those eulogy virtues are ultimately more important, almost all of our focus, all of our mental energy, our time, our striving is dedicated to the other set. We forget to listen to the part of us that calls us back to who we are, who God truly created us to be, and how God might be calling us to live. And when we do this, the danger is how easily we become utterly focused on self. How we are going to get ahead. How we are going to establish ourselves and maintain our security. How we are going to shore up what we have. How we are going to succeed according to the logic of the world. And there opens in us a gap between the life we want to lead, which is one in which Adam II's questions about calling and meaning and the sacredness of human life provide shape and direction for Adam I's creative drive, and the life we so often end up living, which is one in which we have forgotten all of these concerns, or at least we have not paid them due attention until we wake up one day realizing that we are living like the rich fool who fritters his life away frantically building bigger barns only for himself. And in our ironic twist, when this happens, our successes do not stoke feelings of security, but instead of anxiety. What if I haven't made enough? What if I can't live up to my resume? 
What if someone finds out that I'm not perfect? Over time, that anxiety we feel changes healthy ambition into greed, generosity into hoarding, faith into fear. And that's what Jesus wants to address in us in our scripture for today. Peter Gomes, who was the longtime minister of Memorial Church at Harvard University, tells the story of being invited to speak to a class of graduating seniors at an exclusive all-girls school in Manhattan. He thought long and hard about what scripture he might share with them to provide them some comfort and encouragement at a milestone moment in their lives. And so he settled on our text for today, in which Jesus encourages his followers to renew their trust in God's care for all of God's creatures and even for them. He thought there would be something comforting about setting before them the two wonderful images of God's providence that Jesus sets before the disciples, the birds of the air who live without anxiety and yet are fed, and the lilies of the field, wild flowers who are bedecked in beauty, growing in places where they may not even be seen just because God loves them and chooses to clothe them in beauty. So it is with you, he told them, so do not worry. It's a beautiful word we are taken care of, and God lavishes God's love on us even when we have done nothing to deserve it, which is true. So Gomes preached that sermon. God is going to take care of you. Quit worrying about your life. But after the service was over, at the reception, Gomes says that the father of one of the girls came up to me with fire in his eyes and ice in his voice and told me that what I had to say was a lot of nonsense. I replied that I hadn't said it, but Jesus had. Still nonsense, he said, not easily dissuaded by an appeal to scripture. And then he said, it was anxiety that got my daughter into this school. It was anxiety that kept her here. It was anxiety that got her into Yale. It will be anxiety that will keep her there, and it will be anxiety that gets her a good job. You are selling nonsense. Maybe that is how we, too, are tempted to hear the scripture for today. Jesus tells us not to worry, to consider the well-fed birds of the air and the beautiful flowers of the field, how they neither toil nor spin, for God takes care of them, and God will take care of us. And the knee-jerk reaction that tempts us is something like, yeah, but the birds and the flowers don't have bills to pay, gas tanks to fill, reputations to maintain. We want to tell Jesus that actually we need the anxiety we feel in order that we might take care of number one. That anxiety is actually what secures our life. That we are who secures our life. But anxiety is a great liar. It suggests to us that worrying gets us where we need to be and that without it we would be lost. The truth is anxiety always overpromises and underdelivers. It never gets us where we want to go, even though we'd like to believe that all of that mental spinning, all of that hand-wringing we have become so adept at doing is actually productive. Worrying cannot do what we want it to do and what it promises to do, which is to expand life. It doesn't lengthen our days, and it certainly doesn't deepen them. Instead, as philosopher John Caputo puts it, anxiety is like a leakage in time, a seepage which drains the day of its time, which saps its sufficiency, which robs us of the day. So Jesus says to us, do not worry, for I want to give you back the day. And would we have ears to hear him? Jesus says, I want you to live in this day remembering that your life is a gift from God and nothing less. And the God who gives you this day, who made this day so that you might experience God's love for you in the way your lives intersect with the lives of others, so that you might experience God's love in the sunshine, in fellowship, in music, in good work to do, in the bearing of your neighbor's burdens, that God is going to take care of you. Actually, that God is already taking care of you. God knows you are not self-sufficient, for you were created to rely on the one who first gave you breath. God will fill you. God will cover you. 
God has already lavished you with grace and clothed you with beauty, even though you have often missed it. You are beautiful in God's sight and free to live according to that promise. Free, that is, to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God right here and right now. In fact, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Here's the thing. There is plenty to worry about in our world. And you must know that I stand before you today as one who is preaching to herself as I am a masterful worrier. And I know that for some of us, simply resolving not to worry just won't cut it because anxiety is like an itch. Just deciding not to think about it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go away. It nags. More than that, to say, oh, don't worry, be happy, to someone who is truly struggling with managing their concerns, well, that can feel like awfully cold comfort, even a cutting dismissal of a real and difficult experience. But I've never known Jesus to offer cold comfort, have you? or to shrug off the concerns of his people. Which is why I don't think Jesus is just offering us unrealistic optimism or failing to show empathy when he invites us not to worry. Here, when Jesus invites us to consider the birds of the air and the flowers of the field and how God cares for even them, I think he's inviting us to cultivate practices that focus our attention on what is most important about us which is that the God who created us is watching over us and even now dreaming about who he hopes we will become. Jesus is reminding us of that Adam II nature within us that nudges us to live deeply, acknowledging God and trusting God's intentions towards us so that even incrementally, even really subtly, our anxiety over securing our own lives is chipped away. And in turn, we are free to live fuller, more creative, satisfying lives. Perhaps for some of us, a practice to help focus our attention is the one that Jesus commends in the text, which is taking time to contemplate nature, to lie down in a field and be calmed with the poet Wendell Berry by the peace of wild things. Or maybe what helps is staying in a rhythm of worship as often as you can, so that you can have reminders of God's love for you even when you cannot feel it. Maybe, dare I say it, it is turning off Facebook for just a minute in the midst of this election season with its barrage of articles and choosing to pray about those issues in the articles instead of spinning your wheels about them. Or maybe a practice to try for you might be to write your worries down in a journal and offer that simple scribbled list to God as a prayer, and then trust that even that kind of prayer is sufficient. However it is that you can answer Jesus' invitation to stop and to dwell in God's compassionate presence and build these practices into your day however humble, perhaps that is your spiritual act of defiance, your momentary no to anxiety's lies. For your life is God's and not yours to keep. About a year ago, I read a poem by Rosemary Watola Traumer that I have shared with some of you in various venues, and I would like to leave you with it today. Listen with me as she echoes Jesus' invitation to us. That rock that we have been pushing up the hill, the one that keeps rolling back down and we keep pushing back up, what if we stop? We are not Sisyphus. This rock is not a punishment. It's something we've chosen to push. Who knows why? I look at all the names we once carved into its sedimentary sides, how important I thought they were, those names. How I've clung to labels, who's right, who's wrong. How I've cared about who's pushed harder and who's been slack. Now all I want is to let the rock roll back to where it belongs which is wherever it lands. And you and I could imagine, walk unencumbered all the way to the top and walk and walk and never stop except to discover what our hands might do if for once they were no longer pushing. 
Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And there your heart will be also. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. faith using the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us bring our gifts to God.
loving God, you promised to be at work in us and in your church so that we might be made bearers of the good news of your love into all the world. Give us a new boldness as we seek to live for you and for your purposes, and use these gifts we return to you for the sake of the kingdom. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. forth this day with hope and with joy and be led back in peace. Go in the knowledge that in the goodness of God you were born. In the providence of God you are kept every day of your life. And in the love of God fully revealed in Jesus Christ you are redeemed. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.